Hey everyone, this is Scott Swope with UT Extension in White County. Today I'd like to spend a little time uh, learning about the meat processing industry in Tennessee. 2020, wow, what a year. Everything from natural disasters to a pandemic. Uh, I have to confess, I've tried moving the calendar back to 2021, or I guess ahead to 2021. It don't really do any good. I just have trouble keeping up with what day it is. But early 2020, as news of the coronavirus started spreading across the country, consumers started rushing to the grocery store to try to purchase supplies and food. And a lot of us found empty shelves, everything from toilet paper aisle right to the meat counter. And that's where the real meat of this story starts. As these consumers started witnessing empty shelves at the, at the meat aisle, they started turning towards our local beef producers to try to find some locally sourced beef. As these farmers started trying to book dates, that pushed the calendar back, sometimes a year and a half to two years in advance. And so today we're gonna to spend some time learning about our resources here in this state. Uh, we've got a lot of people that are interested in starting uh, livestock processing facilities. And so we're gonna learn from our, our pro professionals here in the state and try to get more information on this subject. Currently in Tennessee, we have 17 USDA inspected meat processors. So USDA inspected processors are those where a producer can take livestock and then retail that meat into commerce. Uh, so we have 17 of those. 14 of those will process livestock for private individuals or producers to retail meat. We have 58 custom exempt processors. So if you market the live animal to a consumer and like, as through a whole or a half share option, then those animals can be taken to custom processors around the state. So since March 15th, when um, kind of everything happened in the state as far as slowing business down and meat processing picked up, we've had, I've had 72 prospect calls and that's statewide. So that's from Memphis to Tri-City. The one thing about our state, of course, we're so short and long that Luckily, we've, they've been extremely spaced out. We haven't had anybody that's just called that's been right on top of each other. I've always said historically for the past few years, if I get one out of 20 prospects that'll construct that I feel good about it. And right now we probably have five to six across the state that have broken ground or will be breaking ground in the next month. So it used to be where you could just, you just called every agency and kind of tried to put information together. And so at the end of 17, what we tried to start doing was funneling prospects through the department to myself. So basically what happens is a prospect will contact Extension, uh, Farm Credit sends calls, Farm Bureau has sent us calls, other agencies that we work with, USDA Rural Development. So they'll send us prospects and they'll contact me. And we'll just kind of talk through the project, where they're located, what they have interest in doing. And then I'll send them basically like an email packet of information. So that packet is going to include UT's feasibility study on meat processing that Dr. Hughes and the Center for Profitable Ag put together. It's going to include a publication from Cornell on red meat processors and design of plants. And then it's going to include a one-sheeter from Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation on wastewater and waste disposal, and a few other items as far as custom slaughter directives from TDA and USDA, as well as information from USDA on HACCP and other items if they are interested in USDA inspection. So once they receive that packet of information, I ask them to review it. Don't get overwhelmed, just read through the information, and then we'll start talking about capacity, what they're wanting to do, how many employees they're looking, what the investment is, and then, if they're still interested in moving forward, then I put together what I call as an agency meeting. So I pull together a meeting of people who would be vested in the project from their specific region and or county. So if you're working, for example, in the Smith County area, we're gonna pull in, for example, Chris Hampton from USDA Rural Development. We're gonna pull in Chris Hicks from Extension and other people from TDAC, USDA Food Safety Inspection Service, our custom inspectors from the Consumer Industry Division with TDA and others to sit around a table and talk about both the financial and funding opportunities for the state as well as technical support that is offered to them as they construct and build out their project. As far as design and layout of the plant, there's not, the, the main difference is, is that you have to supply a 
you have to have a restroom and you have to have an office for a USDA inspector. And when I say office, it doesn't have to be a large room. It basically needs to have enough room for a desk, a filing cabinet, and a chair. So the difference in USDA and custom exempt is that you have to have one, an inspector on site at all times, and two, you have to have what's called a HACCP plan. So the HACCP plan is the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points Plan. And what that plan does is it shows where animals come in on one side, where meat goes out on the other, and in between anywhere where there's the potential of food issues or challenges coming up with food safety and how you would handle those if it did arise. Also, it includes a recall plan if something were happened and you would have to recall meat that did leave that facility. Thank you, Wendy. Producers interested in building a custom processing facility need to be aware of the complexities in such a project. We've asked Steve Anderson, Smith County beef producer and past president of the Tennessee Cattlemen's Association to discuss his experiences in constructing a custom processing facility. I'm Steve Anderson and I started thinking about building a slaughter meat processing facility in 2012. In 2017, I had my first meeting with the Department of Agriculture and some local officials but my main goal was to own my product from pasture to plate and increase profitability for my commercial cow operation. One of the main challenges I faced was design. There's no engineer in this state that's ever built a meat processing facility that I was able to find. So it's, it's new ground for them and there's just lots of things that, you know, even the most brilliant engineer doesn't understand about a meat processing facility and if they don't research it really hard they'll overlook things and not not that they would on purpose but design is, is a real issue. And understand what it's going to cost you to build a facility. It's a romantic notion to own your own slaughterhouse but if you're not prepared to spend over a million dollars it's going to be hard for you to build a facility that has enough size to cash flow and, and, and be productive and uh, make you any money you know and, and that's a very small facility one million dollars you've got um, design fees on top of that you've got capital to operate with on top of that so you're looking at a million plus the the next challenge um, is financing you know you take the best business plan in the world of the bank and most bankers will tell you they've never been presented a business plan that showed a loss. So, you know, no matter how good your business plan looks, no matter how good you think it's going to be, convincing a banker is your next challenge. It's hard to get real numbers. There's lots of small facilities in the state, but they're not going to give you their books. They're not going to show you their profit and loss. They're not going to show you their margin. So, you're going to be working off projections, or I did. Not very many institutions will loan money off of projections. You have to have real hard numbers. You've got to be liquid to some point. You know, I told a few bankers if I had the money they wanted me to have, I wouldn't want to be borrowing money from them to start with. It takes at least, at most places, 20% cash injection to get your loan. So if you're building a million dollar facility, that's $200,000, that's easy figured. So if you're not that liquid, I wouldn't even start the process. Resources that I used in my research and developing my business plan and, and some of the numbers that I used were Rob Holland at Center for Profitable Agriculture. He has a lot of resources. He has a feasibility study that was done in 2017, I believe, for a small processing facility. And they did each region of the state. They focused on Smith County in this region because I was already in the process of researching it. So there's some real numbers that a lot of people don't realize in there on equipment costs, building costs, labor costs. So Rob is a great resource. Another great resource that I use is the Small Business Development Center at MTSU, Christopher Swoner. 
He's super helpful, he's super smart, and he helped me build some projections and spreadsheets that Steve wasn't near smart enough to build. And, you know, he, he's a great resource, and, you know, both of these resources are free. So you don't get much free in life but criticism, but these two resources are free. Once you get past the call shock and decide you still want to go forward, and you find out that you can achieve the financing, Location is the issue. Zoning. A commercial meat processing facility has to be in an industrial zoned area. I-1 is zoning classification for a meat processing facility. Now I think there's some farm exempt stuff that I'm not sure about because I wasn't doing farm exempt so I didn't research it. But if you're going to build a, a larger scale facility and do custom work, you have to have I-1 zoning utilities you know lots of the places that i visited that had septic system uh you know wish they was on sewer uh, the the raw blood uh the wash off blood and the fat constantly clogged their lines and they had all kinds of issues with their water water treatment getting rid of wastewater is a big issue so you know, you need to be close to utilities. You can build it in the country. You can build some type of facility probably on your farm. You know, sewer is not a requirement. But to me, it was a necessity because I didn't want to, after all the issues I'd been told by people that had been operating for years, I didn't want to go through those growing pains with having clogged lines and having to shut down my operation, just work on my utilities, you know. Public water, it, you know, water is one of your biggest uh, usages that you have as far as a utility. That takes, um, and you get different projections from different people. I've been told 100 gallon per animal is a good estimate on, on the water you'll use. So make sure you've got a plentiful water source. If you plan on using any uh, industrial sized equipment, you'll have to have three phase power. So make sure that if you're going to build a larger facility, even if you're building a small plant, if it's a larger small plant, you'll need some three phase equipment. Make sure three phase of power, three phase power is available in your area. Labor. I doubt very seriously if many of you that's considering building the facility are butchers. And I doubt if you know any, and you probably think, well, I'll just hire one. Well, believe me, there's lots of people out there now that would love to just hire one. And when you're breaking down a carcass from a half of beef down into your primal and subprimal cuts, it don't, it's not just a, a grocery store butcher that can do this kind of stuff. A grocery store butcher it's not like it was when I was a kid. You don't see rails where a half of beef comes off a truck at the grocery store anymore. They get it in a box in a vacuum sealed package and they, they break it, it's already broke down and they just trim it up, cut it and repackage it. So uh, if you think you're gonna hire you a grocery store butcher that's gonna come in and be a butcher for you in your uh, slaughter processing facility, then you're gonna be disappointed because most of them wouldn't have a clue how to break down a carcass. So make sure you've got you a butcher that you can count on before you ever get started. If not, you need to take a lot of schooling. They're, the state's been working on some training. I think a couple of universities have been working on some meat cutting training. But right now it's an area that's, that's underserviced. And, and um, I think the Department of Agriculture is looking at some funding to help address this as well. But the butcher is the most important person in your facility because the way he breaks down the individual's animal is going to determine whether they'll ever come back to visit your facility again or not. Outside a butcher, then you've got to have, you've got to have somebody that kills. You know, that's, that's, that's the least favorite part of anybody. Nobody likes to kill animal. You know, we have food animals, but they have to be stunned or killed to harvest. Not everybody is geared to kill. That was one of my biggest challenges. My family, my friends, the people that I planned on helping me, they said, I'll do whatever, but I'm not killing anything. So I, I was fortunate enough to come in contact with a, 
with a man that had worked in a facility before and he had been the kill man and he said he could handle it. So make sure you've got somebody that can kill. And so meat cutting and all this stuff, it's a bloody job. You know, it's a cold job. You're processing rooms, refrigerated. Not everybody wants to be cold five days a week, but eight hours a day. So make sure you can accommodate your labor needs before you go further down the process. If you can't, um, I'd advise you to go other way. Disposal of off all. Now, years ago, there were several companies in the area that would come around and pick up off all at facilities. Most of those have faded out or merged, and it's one of the bigger challenges of the people I've talked to in researching mine is getting rid of your off all. I'm very fortunate. Our county has a class one landfill. I can dump my off all in a class one landfill. Of course, I have to pay a tipping fee to dump it. There's the uh, composting option, but you've got to build a composting barn, and it's pretty labor intensive. Uh, but I've checked with two or three places, and I've not been able to make a deal with anybody to come and pick up my off all. So your inedibles, your intestines, your bones that you don't use, uh, head, feet, Raw, uh, raw blood, everything's got to go somewhere. So make sure you can get rid of your off all without it, you know, the expense of that just killing your profit margin. Hides, a lot of people figure a profit out of a hide. Uh, I've talked to some of my friends in the business that's paying people to come and get their hides and take them to the dump. The hide market is in the tank. So if you're banking on a big income from hides, you can probably mark that way down. It may even cost you money, so you need to try to find a hide market or be prepared to pay somebody to haul them off or haul them off yourself. There is some profit out there. I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but if anybody knows me, they know that I, I don't sugarcoat stuff. I just tell you like it is. If it makes you bleed, you got thin skin. But if you're going to get in the slaughter business, you better be prepared to invest a lot of money, do a lot of research, and work hard. And you know, there's some profit and, and some potential there for you, but if everybody that's checked into it builds a slaughter facility, there'll be a lot of broke people in a few years. So think long and hard before you invest this kind of money. And if you're in it for the long haul or just a short profit. Another great resource for anyone interested in starting a new ag business venture is the Center for Profitable Agriculture. And today we're joined with Jared Bruin. Jared is the marketing specialist with Center for Profitable Agriculture. Jerry, today we've been talking about livestock processing facilities and, um, and the cost and everything associated with starting one of those. Can, do you care to share with us uh, what role CPA has in assisting those producers when they're maybe interested in starting the, the research process and stuff on establishing one of those new facilities? Absolutely. So when we have producers or others that are interested in starting a livestock slaughtering or processing facility and they reach out to us at the center or through their local ag agent, we kind of have a multiple tier uh, approach of how we'd like to work with them. Uh, the first approach is that we provide them a uh, listing of publications that they uh, would find helpful and, and resourceful that they can look through in their own time and, and learn a lot more about the considerations or a lot of the hidden details that are associated with starting up such a uh, expensive business. Um, we make sure that they're, they feel comfortable uh, understanding the different components that go into starting a livestock slaughtering or processing facility. From there, if, we, if, if they feel comfortable and they'd like to proceed and, and continue to work with us at the center, uh, we then uh, try to uh, get into a little bit more deeper detail and understanding of the financial uh, costs and impact that go along with starting up a facility. Um, so there we work with uh, Dr. David Hughes's um, uh, feasibility analysis for starting a livestock slaughter and processing facility. Um, from there, they really get a good, a good understanding of, uh, through that publication, of what the costs uh, that are to start up a facility and then run it uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, if, if we still have producers that are interested after they've made it through those two phases, uh, we then have the uh, ability to work with them more on a one-on-one -on -one situation uh, to dive a little bit deeper into the specifics uh, of their uh, project, of what their idea would be for their facility. And from there, we can uh, work with them using a spreadsheet to, to look at their specific costs uh, and their capital outlays that it would be required to start the facility. We hope this video has been useful to you. If you have any questions, be sure and contact your local University of Tennessee Extension agent.